Hello, my name is J.D. Coral. I'm an interventional cardiologist at the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I serve as the medical director of the Christ Hospital CLI and PAD program. As it relates to this discussion today, I don't have any relevant relationships or con commercial interests to disclose, and neither does Dr. Patel. Hey everyone, I'm Mitul Patel. I'm one of the interventional cardiologists at UC San Diego and uh, direct the uh, endovascular interventions here as well, and I'm glad to be here. Hopefully this is very educational for our audience. Thanks, Mattel. This is a uh, very interesting case. 78-year-old male who presents with Rutherford 5 peripheral heart disease and a non-healing necrotic ulcer of his right great toe. Past medical history includes uh, PAD and CLI, of course, as well as non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, systolic congestive heart failure, diabetes, end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So the usual suspects in this patient. Evaluation started with an arterial duplex study in September of 2020. ABIs were not obtained due to vessel non-compressibility. There was multiphasic flow in the right common femoral artery, mild to moderate diffuse plaque in the superficial femoral artery and popliteal artery with multiphasic flow. The anterior tibial artery was occluded and that occlusion extended into the dorsal pedal artery. The peroneal artery on the right was patent with multiphasic flow and there was diffuse non-obstructed plaque in the posterior tibial artery with monophasic flow. Based on his presentation and the findings on that non-invasive study, he was referred to our CLI program. I saw him in the office in October of 2020. At that time, you can see the necrotic ulceration on that right gray toe. On exam, he had palpable pulse in the PT zone, uh, no Doppler pulse or palpable pulse at the uh, dorsal pedal. This led to an angiogram in November of 2020. You can see the initial diagnostic images. The um, SFA and popliteal artery are non-obstructive, not shown here, but you can see the right panel below the knee, the anterior tibial artery is occluded. Peroneal artery looks patent as does the PT. And you can see the angiogram of the foot. There's distal filling of that anterior tibial artery, small island filling via collaterals, as well as the distal DP. You can see a little bit of filling distally there via collaterals. So based on those findings, a decision was made to proceed with uh, intervention. So we obtained access in the uh, right common femoral artery in an integrated fashion. Those diagnostic images we just showed were via the left radial approach. The plan was to potentially use right dorsal pedal axis if needed uh, to cross that CTO from below. Can I ask Next a slide. question here, Dr. Carl? Yep. So uh, did, you, did you stage the uh, diagnostic and uh, interventional aspect of these cases or, or was this all in one? All in one. So we yeah. typically get our diagnostics radial. I think his, the reason we went left radial is he's got a dialysis fistula on the right. Usually right radial for diagnostics and then further access points as needed for the intervention. Yeah, I find uh, a lot of folks, including myself, are doing this now because it, it really gives you a nice lay of the land and uh, lets you know whether you, know, you need to A, get femoral access, and if so, um, integrate or uh, retrograde and crossover. So um, I think this is a great, great approach to this. Um, do, do you wanna comment here quickly on, uh, on why you chose an integrate approach as opposed to an up and over approach, uh, perhaps for our audience? Yeah, so usually, you know, typically I try to avoid femoral access altogether, just try to work uh, radial and tibial, but cases like this where you're going to get into the pedal loop, potentially, I like to be on the same side. So anti-grade uh, ipsilateral femoral axis to get the reach and you don't have that tortuosity up and over. So typically anti-grade, uh, if I'm going to be down on the foot in the pedal loop, sometimes I'll come up and over, but overall try to avoid femoral axis altogether if possible. Great. Thank you. So you can see our wire this is actually a Mongo wire. We tried multiple wires in an integrate approach down that anterior tibial artery, but dead end street. And if there's uh, a retrograde uh, option or distal access option, I typically don't spend too much time with an integrate cross of these tibial CTOs. So as in this case, we did obtain uh, dorsal pedal access with ultrasound guidance. You can see that little island of distal dorsal pedal artery that fills with collaterals able to access with ultrasound guidance and place a four French sheath. 
Here you can see the track of the wire. Uh, instead of going up and meeting that wire, that anti wire in the anterior tibial artery, it diverted over. Looks like it goes up the peroneal artery, up into the pop and free up into the SFA. So this looks like either a collateral or an anomalous path up into that peroneal artery. So here's a quick video of us snaring that wire from the femoral sheath. This is a gooseneck snare. We usually use a 10 millimeter snare, externalize that wire. And now we have a, a through and through situation with the flossed wire. Did some gentle balloon angioplasty through that uh, DP sheath just to make some room for the IVUS. Then we came back with the IVUS from above to image that I guess we'll call a distal anterior tibial artery as well as that anomalous connection. You can see these IVUS images show a true lumen wire path. And this is not a collateral, this is an actual vessel uh, with that anomalous connection of the peroneal to that distal anterior tibial artery feeding that dorsal pedal artery. So Dr. Carl, let me uh, ask you a couple questions here. Number one, how often are you using IVUS in this? I mean, obviously the data for the coronaries is indisputable, but I think those of us that do a lot of peripheral interventions uh, are now adopting uh, a lot of use of IVUS. How often do you use it for CLI type of interventions? We use it on almost every case. And, you know, we just gain so much information on the plaque morphology as far as calcium. is a lot more calcium than appreciated, especially in these tibial vessels. And then vessel sizing, it's always undersized on the um, angiogram. So the IVUS helps us size these vessels better for whatever balloon or lithotripsy, et cetera, that we're going to use. So we yeah. use it on almost almost every case. That's fantastic. I, I hope that other operators start adopting this uh, this approach to to revascularization. And then my other question is, um, you know, there. I think at some point you were concerned that uh, this may be just a distal AT occlusion. Um, and was there any concern about going across this uh, this collateral? What looked like a collateral into the perineal. I mean, obviously, if this is a, a collateral, it may not be something you want to dilate necessarily, but it seemed you were fairly confident here that this was just an anomaly. Um, what, what led you to that level of confidence, I guess? Well, the, the way the wire initially reacted on that anti-grade cross, it was, didn't feel like a CTO, just felt different. And then you can see calcification. It may not be as clear on this, but you can see calcification tracking over which gave us a clue that this may have been an anomaly. And the way it sort of transitioned gradually as opposed to what you see in collaterals, not so gradual. So we just gently ballooned it with that 2.5 just to make some space for the IVUS, uh, but didn't get real aggressive with that balloon, just wanted to get some space. Nice, yeah, uh, de definitely no, uh, no substitute for, for experience and feel. So that's, that's fantastic, thank you. So it became clear that we were dealing with an anomaly and based on the Kim classification from his paper in 1989, this looks like a type 3B variation where you have a uh, hypoplastic AT and then a distal AT and dorsal pedal arteries fill from the peroneal. So at this point, we reversed the wire, put the working tip out the uh, dorsal pedal sheath. We pulled that tip back into the dorsal pedal artery, removed the sheath then advance that wire across the anastomosis around the pedal loop, and you can see up into the uh, posterior tibial artery. Then we advance a small balloon just to get hemostasis across that axis site, did a prolonged inflation. Usually we do about five minutes on these inflations just to get hemostasis. Technique we call karate toes, but I think just internal hemostasis is the usual term. And then we were able to work around that uh, pedal loop with uh, balloon angioplasty. Here you can see a, a 30210 tapered balloon. Again, the IVUS gave us the confidence on the size. We took that all the way around the pedal loop, um, dilated the pedal loop, the, the dorsal pedal that I guess we'll call a distal anterior tibial artery as well as the anomalous connection back in the peroneal artery with some prolonged inflations. And you can see on the right panel there, the selective angiogram uh, through the balloon catheter after uh, balloon angioplasty. Then here's your final angiograms from the SFA. You can see that peroneal artery transitioning over to the distal anterior tibial artery through that anomalous connection down into the DP around the pedal loop. And of course the posterior tibial artery is still patent. Then the right panel shows you the uh, uh, proximal vessels and that anterior tibial artery just hypoplastic artery as opposed to an occlusion uh, based on these findings.
So as follow-up uh, after revascularization, patient did undergo a partial amputation of that necrotic tissue on that right great toe, but with aggressive wound care and medical management, he was able to avoid a major amputation. So a couple questions for you, Mike Tool. This is um, the prevalence of these tibial pedal artery anomalies. Uh, how prevalent are these anomalies? I'm sure you see them in your practice. I've been yeah. seeing them for years and really didn't um, quantify them, but they're there. Uh, what's no. your guess on the prevalence? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I felt like it was always around 10%. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the, the 9%. And uh, you're absolutely right. You know, there's times when you feel like, oh, man, this, this AT is occluded. And now we have this whole concept of deep venous arterialization and whatnot. And, you know, if, if you're not savvy and don't know that this could potentially be an anomaly rather than an occlusion, you may opt for something like that. So um, I think this is fantastic that you picked this up, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess B. Okay, next slide. All right. Absolutely right, about 10% uh, on these anomalies. So these are common. These, they're out there. We see them. So next question for you, what are the relatively common uh, variations that we see? Um, and you can have more than one answer here. Okay, well, I've definitely seen, and I think we all encounter a high takeoff AT above the knee joint. So I'm going to put uh, A on there for sure. Um, and given the fact that we just saw a hypoplastic AT, I'm going to assume that there could be a <laughs> hypoplastic PT. And then I do encounter the trifurcation fairly often. High takeoff of the peroneal, I haven't really seen that often. And then, well, I guess since we just got the hypoplastic AT and PT, then I, I'm assuming E would also be an option. I'm going to go A, C, D, and E. Okay. Oh, almost. <laughs> so I think that last <laughs> one's more of a, you know, so, sort of a super dominant peroneal that gives off plantar as NDP. So yeah. that's, that's pretty rare. I don't think I've seen that. And then you're right on that high takeoff of the peroneal, very rare, uh, less than 0.2%. But the other ones are common, 2.9% for that above the knee takeoff of the AT, 2.4 for the uh, hypoplastic PT with the plantars filling from the peroneal most of the time, and then that trifurcation about 2%. So in conclusion and summary, these variations are common. About 91% of patients have the normal uh, vascular patterns where 9% have these variations. Here's that Kim classification uh, figure here. You can see in the upper left uh, corner is the normal um, anatomy. The 1A is normal. You can see the uh, type 2A with that high takeoff of the AT. There's two variations of that. That's important not only for us, but also orthopedic surgeons that do knee surgeries, they can encounter that anterior tibial artery and ligate it uh, with knee surgeries. The type 3A, the hypoplastic or aplastic PT, about 2.4% 2, 2 there in the bottom left. The 1B class, um, type 1B classification up there, the top line, the trifurcation of the AT, peroneal, and PT, about 2%. So individuals that have an anomaly in one leg, about 21% risk of the similar anomaly on the contralateral leg. And these anomalies are equal when it comes to men versus women. So we'll talk about the anterior tibial artery a little bit. We already talked about that high takeoff. Here's an example um, of a high takeoff of the AT coming off just above the joint space. Here's an example of a low takeoff with a trifurcation, again, about 2% of patients will have this. And you can see the bottom line, actually, if we can go back one slide, you see the bottom line, the abnormal DP origins. This is what we dealt with in this case. And most of those come off the peroneal. As far as posterior tibial anomalies, about 6.8% of patients have these. This is an example on the right of a high takeoff of posterior tibial artery. When you combine that with the hypoplastic, it's about 3.3%. So I think truly just a true high takeoff of the PT is about 1% of the population. And you can see on the bottom there, atypical plantar arch and plantar arteries. Again, most of these variations, that vessel arises from the peroneal. 
And actually, these three examples, these three slides that I showed with those with those uh, pictures to the right, I got all those within one week of putting this slide deck together because I didn't save any of these and I had to pick some up and all in a single week, we got all three of these uh, pictures. So kind of shows you, kind of underscores how common these are. As far as peroneal artery variations, much less common, just like that question, 0.2% for the high takeoff and less than 2% for that super dominant peroneal with the hypoplastic or aplastic PT and AT. So those are uncommon. So in conclusion, these variations are common. Interventionalists uh, working below the knee or in the popliteal artery need to be aware of these uh, variants when treating below the knee disease, especially in CLI patients. So really quick there, Dr. Carl, I mean, you know, as I mentioned, now that we have, you know, our certain centers have the ability to do things like deep venous arterialization, um, you know, you may be in a situation where you have one of these anatomic variants. Um, how do you, like, what's your, uh, you know, you mentioned that you, you, you had a suspicion based on the way the wire felt at the proximal cap of the AT CTO um, and just the way that the wire behaved once you got retrograde access um, for, for perhaps some of the more novice operators out there that are just getting a CLI program going. Do you feel like maybe a CT or something like that, they may better define this up front. Uh, may be the way to go if you encounter this situation, or, or what would be your advice to uh, a, a less experienced operator? Yeah, that's a good question. I think if you try this and fail, then I think probably a CT to better define that makes sense. I, I don't think I'd do it preemptively, you know, just with a 9% possibility of an anomaly. Uh, but I, I think the best way to get around these is that distal access with a retrograde approach. Without that, I would have had no clue in this case um, because that's what gave us the, the path into the peroneal artery. So I think access is everything on these cases and distal access is the key. Um, so that's really where the skill set has to be honed as far as vascular access, ultrasound guided vascular access in those distal vessels, even when you just have a small island or maybe no distal filling with collaterals. And do you, when you do that retrograde access, um, do you, how much do you push with, let's say, the micropuncture wire versus going with, you know, another 014 wire through your through your needle? What's your? Yeah, I always try to use. Yeah, it's a good. Question. I always try to use the wire with the needle. You don't want to strip a coat off trying to get out um, if you do run into something. But I don't push it. You know, you don't want to prolapse that or or get a loop on that. And usually those plaque is pretty soft when you're inside those. So it, it usually goes pretty good. And you can tell by the path that you're in it, as long as it's not buckling, et cetera. And you can follow it up with ultrasound as well, just to see where you are. Right. Well, I, I want to thank you. This is a, a fantastic uh, case, obviously. And, and you brought up some fantastic learning points with all the various anatomic variations and, and the reference to the, to the Kim paper, I think is invaluable for uh, those of us that are doing this type of work. Uh, so if you're getting a program started and, um, you know, not the most experienced operator like Dr. Carl is, please uh, take a look at this recording again and again, take a look at the references and, and make sure you study these patients. Uh, because as, as was shown here, you can really salvage limbs um, by doing the right thing uh, for your patients and approaching them very systematically. So thank you very much. That was fantastic. I appreciate the time and thanks for moderating. Yeah, sure.